They are supposed to be angels of mercy, healers, the ultimate professionals. But sometimes they can go terribly wrong. 1982. A Texas nurse administers death on her daily rounds. Why wasn't she found out earlier? 1984. A mysterious doctor with a shady past has a passion for poison. Can the authorities stop him from dispensing medicine again? 1987. Malpractice in military medicine is exposed. Why can't our soldiers and sailors sue their doctors? We'll look at important and tragic cases that woke up America. How you can protect yourself against dangerous medical care. And Professor Arthur Miller of the Harvard University Law School examines the larger issues involved when we open the justice file. They make miracles every hour, every day. Curing diseases, saving lives, bringing comfort, helping those in need. And almost all of our medical professionals are just that, professionals, dedicated to the highest levels of care. But the system that polices our 600,000 doctors and 1.6 million nurses runs on honor. And when it goes awry, there can be a trail of death and injury left in its wake. And that is our focus. We begin in Texas in 1982. Janine Jones seemed like a model nurse, caring, compassionate. But rather than an angel of mercy, she was revealed to be the angel of death. Her story weaves a complex web of deceit and prompted key changes in both criminal and liability law. Kerrville, Texas, a little cow town north of San Antonio. Medicine here is still small town. When the new specialist arrived in the summer of 82, that's where the troubles began. Dr. Kathy Holland has been told by her attorneys not to discuss what happened during the first month she practiced here. A month when parents trusted her and brought their children in for treatment. Dr. Holland, as it turned out, could be trusted, but the nurse who came with her could not. Janine Jones was arrested for murder and for causing injury to numerous children under her care. No, you cannot. Did you murder those children? Did you murder those children? How do you feel when you hear and you know people are saying, you are a baby killer? <laughs> you have killed babies under your care. How do I feel? I wish I could put it into word. Anger. Uh, a lot of anger. Did you, on some of your patients, uh, hold them and rock them and, and talk to them after they had died? I would sing to them, certainly. Um, it wasn't a, a broadcast. It was a private thing between the child and I. It was my tribute to them, my, my allowing them to die with dignity. <laughs> Janine Jones does have children of her own, two of them, and that's part of what makes this story so difficult to comprehend. Some call her a tender, caring mother, as well as a good nurse. In fact, a great nurse. <laughs> Others claim she is a morbid and crazy, cold-blooded killer. Natural. The state of Texas reached that conclusion after they solved the medical riddle of how she did it. This piece of paper was a key clue. On the very day they opened for business, they ordered a drug, a nectine, a drug so powerful it's almost never kept in a doctor's office. It's been called the perfect killer because it virtually vanishes in the body. When they opened for business, the enactine in the new office inventory was signed for by Nurse G. Jones. It looked good. A new clinic, a new doctor, a new nurse, a new practice in town, and of course, new patients. But on eight separate occasions during that first month after Dr. Holland opened her office here, her patients experienced medical emergencies. They had to be rushed back to the old hospital downtown. Four-month-old Christopher Parker was rushed to the hospital with respiratory distress. Brandy Benitez, a one-month-old whose pulse nearly stopped altogether. And 14-month-old Chelsea McClellan. She, too, stopped breathing. All were rushed to the emergency room at the old Sid Peterson Hospital, and all were revived, their normal breathing restored. I need to give us some lidocaine. Despite these three emergencies in just two weeks, parents in Kerrville kept bringing their children in and trusting. Misty Raganow would become victim number four. She only had mouth sores. Nevertheless, she was told to come right in for urgent treatment. And once there, Janine Jones said it was necessary to immediately start an IV. I saw Janine start to clean her arm off and stick the needle in. They were going to use it up here. They had already tied it off. 
and they started to stick it in, and Misty just kind of went limp. She just quit screaming and hollering. She had this far off look. It was the weirdest thing you've ever experienced or that I have because, I mean, she had this look like, gosh, help me. You know, I can't do anything. And I told Janine then, I said, you got to do something. Something's happened. And she said, oh, no, she's just hyperventilating. She's just crying. Misty had a seizure that was so severe, Janine later said, they considered using the muscle relaxant, a nectine. We couldn't even breathe for her with the bag because her teeth were clenched and the air was just bouncing back at us. While she was doing this, the doctor ordered a nectine. But according to both Jones and Holland, they decided not to use the nectine. Instead, they rushed Misty to the now familiar Sid Peterson emergency room, where just as suddenly as her breathing had stopped, it started up again. After Misty's close call, Janine left her job on medical leave. While she was away, not a single emergency case came out of Dr. Holland's office. But like clockwork, on the very day Janine returned to work, two children under her care stopped breathing. Five-month-old Jacob Evans was acting cranky. Janine diagnosed it as a rare disease and started an IV. She said that it was in case he went into seizures during the testing, they could give him medication promptly. Janine then insisted the Evans wait in the lobby. We had been out there possibly a minute or two, and we heard Jacob start crying. And then in mid-scream, there was just dead silence. I clearly heard someone in the background say he's dead. I know I heard that. Like the others, Jacob was rushed to the emergency room, where his breathing suddenly started up again. Chelsea McClellan would not survive Janine Jones' care, and her case would break this story wide open. Basically, her physical exam was fine, and I told Mrs. McClellan we needed to update her immunizations. And I told Janine to give the child two shots. The mother's quoted as saying, after that first shot, the child began to have difficulty, uh, began to show signs of having seizure, began to have trouble breathing. No, Chelsea just held her breath. She you, held her breath. You've got children, you know, when they're hurt, they usually hold their breath. If they fall or if they hurt themselves, they give a big cry and they hold their breath. How do you know if a baby is holding its breath you or is ha having trouble breathing? You don't. Uh, what I did at that point was blow into Chelsea's face two or three times, and after the third time, she took a nice deep breath and started breathing normally again. So then you gave the second shot. Right. I waited till she calmed down and cuddled up to Mama, and then I gave the second injection. What happened immediately after the second injection? About the Chelsea? same thing. She just held her breath, and blowing in her face did not help her at all. Chelsea was stabilized at the Sid Peterson Hospital, but her condition was so serious they decided to transfer her immediately to a larger hospital in San Antonio. There was no heartbeat at all. Uh, CPR had been started by myself. The uh, emergency medical technician in the back with me was doing the breathing for the child. Um, Dr. Holland took over the, the CPR and ordered the drugs which were given to her. We then, instead of trying to make it San Antonio, which would have been stupid, went to the nearest hospital, which was Comfort, and continued to work on her for over an hour, actually, until the doctor finally called the code. There wasn't a dry eye in the emergency room. I think uh, perhaps Janine may have taken it harder. She took it like it was perhaps one of her own children. On Chelsea's medical chart, the nurse later wrote, I would have given my life for hers. Goodbye, Chelsea. After so many close calls, the death of Chelsea McClellan finally set off alarm bells in the Kerrville medical community, and attention was about to be focused on Janine Jones. When we come back, the investigation begins as the Justice Files continues. Searching for the perfect shave? You'll find it with Norelco. Our lift and cut system lifts the hair so when it's cut, it can drop below skin level without the blades touching your face. So for a perfect shave, remember, Norelco makes clothes comfortable. Nighttime backache? Try Momentum Muscular Backache Formula. Momentum has a maximum strain pain reliever to help relieve your backache so you can sleep. My back feels great, and I slept like a log. Momentum Muscular Backache Formula.
The new Nissan Altima comes equipped with liquid-filled engine mounts that significantly reduce vibration and engine noise. But haven't I seen this before? And while you've seen a demonstration like this done for a luxury car before... I thought so. You've never seen it done for one that starts at $13,000. That's refreshing. The new Nissan Altima. It's time to expect more from a car. Can you know if you're in danger? I knew something was wrong. What you learned from this program could save your life. Let me tell you right now, an ambulance. How to prevent a heart attack. Monday at 9 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Something new has happened at AT&T. Something beyond having more operators than any other long-distance company. Something more than helping you in just about any language you speak. It's the new AT&T Special Country Plan. Save 15% off AT&T international rates with no sign-up costs and no monthly fees. It's easy to come back. Call 1-800-647-9803. Dealing with one bill is still as convenient as you remember. But now you save 15%, not just to one person, but to everyone in the international country of your choice. There's never been more reasons to come back. Call now. You can still count on AT&T quality. But did you know that you can call one of over 200 international countries and cities and save 15%? If you ever thought about coming back, now is the time. 1-800-647-9803. AT&T. You couldn't pick a better time to come back. The near deaths of so many infants had not raised many eyebrows in Kerrville, Texas, but the death of a child finally did. Now doctors and investigators were about to look carefully at nurse Janine Jones, her record, and her methods of treatment, and they would be horrified at what they found. Chelsea's death, plus a seventh emergency case, launched a probe by the press and also raised questions at Sid Peterson Hospital. Among the first and most suspicious was the oldest doctor in Kerrville, Dr. Dwayne Packard, an old-fashioned general practitioner who had never had a single child stop breathing in his office. I've practiced here since 1940, and I've never seen one. And this was, in my best of my recollection, a total of seven. It was enough for Dr. Packard to start his own investigation. He recruited a colleague, a young surgeon, Dr. Joe Venus, to find out more about Dr. Holland and also her nurse. His investigation took him from Kerrville to San Antonio, 60 miles away. Venus telephoned a friend here at the South Texas Medical Center where Janine had worked, and what he was told stunned him. It turned out that for more than a year prior to her arriving in Kerrville, there had been ugly rumors floating through the corridors of the pediatric department. Down the hall there in the intensive care unit, doctors and nurses began noticing that too many babies were dying from sudden and unexplained reasons. In almost every case, they occurred on the 3 to 11 p.m. nursing shift, and one nurse was always at their bedside when they died, Janine Jones. It was said she was good at her job. She took charge in times of crisis, and she had a specialty that none could match, inserting needles into the tiny veins of babies IVs to keep them medicated. Because so many babies like these died while others came close to dying while under Janine's care, doctors and nurses had begun calling it the death shift. On her days off, nothing went wrong. On her vacation, nothing went wrong. The minute she would come back, something would go wrong. And we all watched the schedule, you know, and it got to be that we could almost predict when something was going to go wrong. Did you ever make a statement or a question to a nurse there? Why are there so many babies dying on my ship? I said that at one point, yeah. What were you thinking when you said that? I was just sick and tired of seeing kids die. I mean, I had, at that point in time when I made that statement, I had a lot of pressures on me at that time. And I was just sick of the pressures and sick of sick kids and sick of people dying on me. And I was just really tired of it. The so-called death shift was investigated by the hospital. Those findings concluded that negligence or wrongdoing by Nurse Jones cannot be excluded. But despite early suspicions, when Janine Jones quit her job here and traveled to the hill country of Kerrville, she was, believe it or not, 
given a good recommendation. Now, more than one month later, at the Sid Peterson Hospital, Joel Venus was told of her dark past on the phone with his contact at the public hospital. He said, it looks like you've got a baby killer on your hands. It's going to be a little stick in the stain. That same day, Dr. Frank Bradley, a Kerrville anesthesiologist, happened to be in the emergency room when an eighth patient of Dr. Holland's was brought in, not breathing. Stick in a stain. Bradley recognized the symptoms and pinpointed the culprit. The child there that day, what was your impression uh, when you saw it coming back around? That it had been given an ectine. That was the way that it appeared to me. That was what I see all the time when I let people come back from an ectine. Dr. Holland refuses to discuss it today. But back then, an emergency meeting was called by the senior medical staff at Sid Peterson, and Holland was brought in for questioning. In that meeting, as I recall, Dr. Holland was asked about the use of the drug an ectine. She indicated that she had some in her office but never used it. Suspicious, Dr. Holland went out and checked the bottle of anectine herself. What she saw when she picked up the bottle caused her to urgently ask Dr. Venus to come right over. When I went there, she showed me a full bottle of anectine. She handed me the vial, and I looked at it. It had been opened. It had at least two needle holes in the top. She was afraid that someone had indeed used anectine. Did she say who? Well, she told me that she asked Janine Jones, if she had used the anectine, and Janine Jones responded to her, no, did you? I asked her how I was going to explain the presence of those holes. I said, I've got to explain those holes. How am I going to do that? She said, I don't think we should explain it at all. I think we should just throw the vial away and tell them we lost it. When I held a fresh bottle of anectine up side by side to it, I expected at that time to, to find the used bottle to be a little uh, less full than the uh, unused bottle, Un uh, but as it were, the, uh, the used bottle had more fluid in it. It appeared that something had been injected into the vial, and when the fluid was later tested, it proved to be mostly saline solution, salty water. That same day the needle holes were discovered, Janine Jones came here, to the graveyard, where Chelsea was buried. Now, desperate and under much pressure, she took an overdose of pills in an unsuccessful attempt to kill herself. In a suicide note that Janine left for Dr. Holland, she insisted she was not guilty of murder. Later, to prove it, she agreed to cooperate with authorities. Did you take a lie detector test? Mm hmm What did it show? I'm not gonna comment on it. <laughs> did it show that you were telling the truth? I'm not gonna comment on it. <laughs> did Janine Jones take a lie detector test? Yes. What was the outcome of it? She failed. Dr. Holland also took a lie detector test, and she too failed. But despite that test, in time, investigators couldn't find any evidence to indicate that Dr. Holland had been involved in causing any of the emergencies. Every clue pointed solely toward Janine. In retrospect, after having found those vials, after her explanation and her suggestion for what to do with them, after looking back at the children and what happened to the children, I have to say that I think that she did. At first, the prospects for an indictment were considered hopeless because the drug anectine, suspected as the murder weapon, was thought to be untraceable. Janine was feeling confident during this period. She devoted much of her free time to her family. And almost unbelievably, she was hired to do part-time work at a nursing home. All during this time, Ron Sutton's investigation dragged on. And then, a breakthrough. He learned of a brand new test to detect a nectine in an embalmed body. Nearly eight months after Chelsea McClellan had died, the district attorney came here to the cemetery where she'd been buried. He had obtained a court order to exhume her body so that tissue samples could be taken from the upper thighs where the little girl had had those two shots back at the doctor's office. Those tissue samples taken from the grave were then flown to an expert in Stockholm, Sweden. Based on Dr. Olmsted's findings, Janine Jones was indicted for murder and injury to seven children in Kerrville. She was later indicted in San Antonio as well. Today, she is not the only party being blamed for the tragedies here in South Texas. I think that we should have been told. By San Antonio? By San Antonio. Somebody should have put up a red flag. Somebody should have told us one way or the other something was going on. At the Sid Peterson Hospital, things are pretty much back to normal now. Since Janine stopped nursing, not a single child has stopped breathing in Kerrville. 
Oh, yeah, Chelsea's first birthday. The McClellan family still finds it difficult to discuss Chelsea without tears. Mm -hmm. She was their only daughter. They'll never have another since Mrs. McClellan can no longer have children. And finally, Janine Jones, LVN, the paradox. Did the loyal nurse kill for excitement to be the heroine in the center of a crisis? Did she see herself as a God figure, making life or death decisions with babies? All I can do is sit here and tell you, no, I'm not guilty of anything except loving kids. The case of Janine Jones had a far-reaching impact, not only on those involved, but on the medical and criminal justice systems. Janine's crime, multiple murders, is now punishable by death in Texas. She was sentenced to 99 years. Although authorities believe this nurse murdered as many as 16 babies, in 1989, she was already up for parole. Prison officials received more than 12,000 letters in protest, led by the parents of Chelsea McClellan, and parole was denied. She was up for parole seven years after she was in. That's ridiculous. Our judicial system was in such uh, shambles uh, to do something like that. Uh, I think so they finally woke up and said, look, this isn't right. This, this woman's uh, uh, murdered children. Dr. Kathleen Holland, the doctor who hired Janine Jones, was still working in Kerrville but was banned from practicing at the local hospital. She was trying to get her attending rights back. The children in this case might have been saved if the medical establishment had not closed ranks and covered up unpleasant suspicions. Today, major changes in the law mean that county hospitals can be held liable for the criminal or negligent acts of their employees. Reed and Patty McClellan settled wrongful death cases against Dr. Holland and the San Antonio Medical Center out of court. Since their daughter's death, Patty has become a nurse and works for a Houston family doctor. In 1988, they adopted a little girl. That's for you. Kylie has brought them great joy, but Reed and Petty say nothing can ever make up for the cruel way Chelsea was taken from them. They warn parents to be vigilant. Don't ever be afraid to ask questions, you know, because if, if somebody gets upset, a doctor or a nurse gets upset because you ask a question, well, there's a problem, you know. Don't ever be intimidated enough because they're quote, quote, doctor or quote, quote, nurse that you can't feel like that you can ask questions. If you feel like that, find another doctor or nurse. When we come back, we'll meet a mysterious doctor with a questionable and violent past when The Justice Files continues. Coming up next, Armed and Dangerous Top Guns on Challenge. With thousands of great movies at great prices, Blockbuster Video has something for everybody. Save big on great gifts like this. Own the movie that made you jump, shimmy, and shout. Add the fun to your video collection. It's better than ice cream. Better than springtime. Better than sex. No, I, I've heard. From Touchstone Home Video, Sister Act, rated PG. Blockbuster Video. Thousands of great gifts at great prices for everyone on your list. Lunchtime, savor the USA, but drink French. Louis Jadot, Beaujolais Village. At dinner time, choose Chinese, but drink French. Louis Jadot, Chardonnay. Or any time, cook Californian, but drink French. Louis Jadot, Beaujolais Village, and Chardonnay quality and value make any time a great time to be French. For your free guide to more great French wines, call 1-800-522-WINE. It's a great time to be French. While no medicine can stop a cough completely, <coughs> there is one that in 30 minutes can so significantly reduce your coughing, it's guaranteed or your money back. Vicks Formula 44. No wonder doctors recommend Formula 44's cough medicine three times more than codeine. <coughs> Formula 44. Because the fewer the coughs, 
the better. Beneath the crumbling walls of communism, beyond the political face, this is the story of an enduring Russia, a world of baffling contrasts, a tale of fire and ice. This is a portrait of people linked to the land and their struggles as a changing world threatens their natural inheritance. Across frozen tundra and into the great taiga, near the banks of the Volga and beyond the fertile steppes, experience a natural history of epic proportions as the Discovery Channel embarks on a three-hour journey across the rarely seen landscape of ancient Russia. Empire of the Red Bear, a U.S. television premiere, Sunday at 8 Eastern, exclusively on the Discovery Channel. When we go to a doctor's office, we usually see a clean, organized place, degrees on the wall, and a man or a woman in a white coat. We assume, almost always correctly, that he or she is precisely what is claimed, a competent, degreed professional. But how do we know? And what do we really know about our doctors? The mysterious 1984 case of Dr. Michael Swango may make you think twice. If you call an ambulance, it's the paramedics who respond. There are few jobs as demanding. Paramedics usually work day and night, 24-hour shifts. And since nearly every call is an emergency, they have our lives in their hands. One of the finest paramedic units in the country is based at Blessing Hospital in Quincy, Illinois. And people here say one of their best paramedics was Dr. Mike Swango. Dr. Swango worked here for years, mostly part-time while he was in school. And then he worked here again briefly in 1984 after he'd gotten his medical degree. It was then that strange things started happening at the hospital. One day, Dr. Swango brought a box of donuts to the paramedic quarters. He laid box on the table and said, uh, here, here's some donuts for you guys. And he went over and sat in another chair. Four paramedics ate the donuts. Within an hour, they were sick, very sick. I thought my head was going to explode. We all threw up at least twice, three times, some more than that. I thought I was going to die. They thought it was food poisoning. The next night, Brent and Mike were on duty at a high school football game. He brought a Coke back to me. I started drinking it. It uh, wasn't too, too long after that I started vomiting again. About two weeks later, Mike bought Greg Myers a soft drink. Within 10 minutes, I was in the bathroom real deathly sick. Eventually, as the paramedics talked about what they thought had been food poisoning, they realized... Every time someone had gotten sick in the past, Mike had always been around. So they decided they'd keep an eye on Dr. Swango. When Swango offered them food, they turned it down. And when someone's tea tasted unusually sweet, they took it to the local college chemistry department to have it analyzed. The analysis showed heavy metals. Arsenic is a heavy metal. They went to the police, and the police arrested Swango and charged him with assault. Then they went to his house to search for evidence. What they found inside stunned them. Kitchen cabinets were stacked with not food, but chemicals and different types of poisons. There were syringes, a jug of acid, and poisonous castor beans. There were even books that show different ways of killing people. Here it says, the cyanide grenade is a wonderful grenade. The part that amazes me most is the recipe cards. These aren't recipe cards you find in most kitchens. Here's one for botulism. Boil water and fill the jar to the top. They went to his high school. They learned he was brilliant. His IQ was said to be 160. He graduated number one in his class. The National Merit Scholarship people named him High School Student of the Year. But then the police started asking questions in Columbus, Ohio, where the previous year, Swango was a medical intern at Ohio State University. Columbus police were astonished to learn that there had been several suspicious deaths at University Hospital, that hospital officials had suspected Swango, but hadn't told the police. In fact, they recommended Swango for medical licensing. What happened at Ohio State? A nurse told the hospital's investigator, a man I recognized as Dr. Swango appeared to be adding something to Ms. Smith's IV line with a syringe. Two minutes later, I heard the bed rails shake. 
She ran into the room and found Ms. Smith unconscious and not breathing. Doctors were called and they revived her. Ms. Smith couldn't speak, but she asked for a piece of paper and wrote, a blonde doctor put something in my IV and everything went black. This started the nurses talking because they were already suspicious of Dr. Swango. He had been in the rooms of several patients right before they died. For example, Ruth Barrick. The nurse on duty said Dr. Swango was in Ms. Barrick's room. This surprised her because Swango wasn't on rounds, nor had the nurse called him to the room. Six days later, Dr. Swango went back into Ms. Barrick's room to insert an IV tube. He pulled the curtain tightly around her bed and refused an offer by a nurse to assist him. One minute after Dr. Swango told the nurse he was finished, she went into the room and found Ms. Barrick dead. Today, the university admits the investigation was superficial. They didn't interview all the people involved. No one grilled Dr. Swango. They threw the IV tube away, and they never showed pictures of Swango to Ms. Smith. The university's own report suggests the investigators may have been motivated out of concern for preserving the hospital's reputation. They did ask him not to return to finish the five-year residency program, but they let him finish the year at Ohio State. And when he applied for a medical license in Illinois, they recommended him. In Ohio, the prosecutor doubts there will ever be an indictment. Uh, the fact that uh, this case is now two years old, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to come up with any physical evidence now, but we're trying. So Swango left Ohio State to return home to Quincy to work as a paramedic until he got his license to practice in Illinois. And many of us discussed uh, what was wrong with Mike. Why was Mike so different? Why did, why did he come back here? Why was he working as a paramedic when he could have been working as a physician? He was always talking about death and destruction. First of all, I'm, I'm innocent. I could never do any of the things that, were, that have been alleged that I've done. I think my whole life speaks for that. Uh, everything I've done in the past, my work, both as a paramedic and a doctor, and um, I simply could not have done those things. Why do all these people think you did? I don't know. I, I think that some people think I did because they have been misled by evidence that, was, that had, has no integrity and is simply not, does not give a picture of what did, of what did or did not occur. At the trial, the prosecution based its case on all the circumstantial evidence and the ant poison. That was their strongest point. A lab said the poison found in Dr. Swango's house matched the poison in the tea. Swango said he had ant poison because he had an ant problem. And during the trial, he called in an exterminator to confirm it. But the exterminator surprised everyone by saying, these are the wrong ants. This ant is never found indoors, uh, particularly in our area. There were about a thousand of them milling around aimlessly in the kitchen living room. Uh, and it appeared, in my, in my opinion, they had been dumped there. I asked Dr. Swango about that. You know, I don't know anything about ants. All I know is I had an ant problem and I took care of it as best I could. At the end of the trial, the judge said, Dr. Swango, I've really come to like you during this trial, but I don't believe you. He pronounced him guilty and gave him the maximum sentence, five years. Most of the testimony came from the paramedics and it centered on Dr. Swango's strange behavior. He'd collect clippings from newspapers all over the United States and. Uh, on the disasters and uh, fatalities. And do what with them? He'd put them in a scrapbook. He had uh, numerous scrapbooks. One he, he entitled Trauma on the Highways. It was nothing but car accidents, uh, trailer trucks smashing into cars. Some of them certainly involved death and accidents, which unfortunately are part and parcel of, you know, of paramedics and of medicine in general. If I'd been found innocent at this trial, the, the fact that I, you know, had a scrapbook of anything would make no difference to anybody. It's inference. It's, it's, it's taking one thing and implying another when there's really no connection. Why all these poisons? Again, the only poisonous substances, which I think is a much better term than poison, in the house that I had were ones that you could probably find in almost every house in Quincy, Illinois, or in any other city in this country. Now what about the incidents at the hospital at Ohio State? Student nurse said, you were in the room. You put something in the IV tube, suddenly the woman goes into convulsions. I deny any criminal behavior or any violation of uh, the Hippocratic Oath. And 
in working in Ohio or working anywhere. The judge said that maybe there are two of you. I think the judge is wrong. He also wanted you to get psychiatric help. Did you ever think of seeing anyone? Or he said that thinking that I was guilty. I'm not guilty. I didn't do those things. Do you know if some people are scared of you now about your getting out? I'm sorry about that. There's certainly no reason for anybody to be scared, none whatsoever. The strange tale did not end in 1986. The story continued to twist and turn. After serving less than two and a half years of his five-year sentence, Dr. Swango was paroled without ever having received psychiatric treatment. I think he's capable of doing virtually anything. Tom Leeper was Illinois State's attorney in the Swango case. By 1992, he says the state had received inquiries from North Dakota, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania about a doctor they believed to be Michael Swango. According to letters and documents supplied to us by the Illinois State's Attorney's Office, Swango changed his name legally to David Adams. In 1991, he applied for a job at a Wheeling, West Virginia hospital, where he was considered a promising candidate, until administrators learned that he provided them with altered court papers and lied about serving jail time for a fight in a restaurant, not for poisoning six co-workers. Certainly, as long as the state uh, registration board, wherever he happens to be, is aware of his history, he won't be allowed to practice medicine. The problem is, if he can forge documents and uh, land somewhere where they aren't aware or don't check on his history. What is Dr. Swango up to now? If the paper trail is any evidence, he is still playing with the truth. And those who know him worry that he may be using his brilliant mind and medical skills to play with people's lives. When we come back, we'll look at a medical system where you can't sue your doctor even if he or she makes a terrible mistake when the Justice Files continues. How can you know if you're in danger? I knew something was wrong. What you learn from this program could save your life. Let me tell you right now, an ambulance... How to prevent a heart attack. Monday at 9 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Christmas is about families, and so is this computer, the Tandy 2500 RSX from Radio Shack. For the incredible price of $799.95, you get a 386SX 25 megahertz processor with 24 built-in programs for budgeting, word processing, and home education. With the power to run PC-compatible software, made in America by American families. Christmas, families, and the Tandy 2500 RSX, they go together. From Radio Shack, your Christmas electronics store. family farmers paying the price for an ecological misunderstanding. I'm John Palmer. Join me for Dreams Turn to Dust. A Discovery Journal world premiere, Wednesday at 10 Eastern. You need to know how memory works. I wonder how often I should save the pages I'm working on. You'd like to know more about color graphics. You need to know how windows work. Are these windows going to change my original document? You'd like to know the difference between personal computers. For everything you need to know and would like to know about computers, there's Understanding Computers from Time Life Books. Call now to examine your first book, Computer Basics, free for 10 days. Keep it and pay just $14.99, then other books will follow. Cancel any time. 
You'll learn the terms they don't explain in computer magazines or manuals to make learning about computers easy, even if you've never used one before. Whatever you need or would like to know, understanding computers begins with Time Life Books. Call 1-800-765-1115 to examine computer basics. Keep it for $14.99 plus shipping and handling. Use your credit card today and get this calculator watch free. Return the book for a refund if not satisfied. Call 1-800-765-1115. You're in a hospital for a routine procedure and something goes terribly wrong. You have the right to find out what happened, and you can even sue for malpractice. But for the millions of U.S. military personnel who have been treated in military hospitals, there is no such thing as malpractice and no such thing as an investigation. As of 1992, it's still legal, and it was first given national attention in this 1987 report. The first thing Robert Longo does when he gets up in the morning is take a painkiller. Before he goes to bed at night, he takes a sleeping pill. Over the last year, he has come to this Veterans Administration Hospital in Boston more than 40 times for tests to determine whether the cancer that cost him the use of one leg and then spread to his lungs has become active again. He is 26 years old with a wife, Patty, and a 30% chance of surviving the next five years, according to doctors. Longo also lives with the painful knowledge that in that crucial period when his cancer first appeared, the military doctors he visited as an active duty serviceman failed to treat it or even to diagnose it. Time after time, they insisted that the bulge growing on his leg was a muscle pull. I said, this is hurting more and more, and it's getting larger. And they didn't, they said, no, it's not getting bigger. It's in your imagination. They dragged this on for two, two and a half months, and if I didn't persist, keep persisting, telling them I wanted something done about me, I would have been sitting there for another four to six months waiting to die. <laughs> it wasn't until the cancer was the size of a grapefruit that Longo was finally sent to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where he did get a proper diagnosis. Had he been a civilian at the time, the careless delay in diagnosing and treating his cancer would have entitled him to sue those responsible for damages and to require an investigation. But as Longo would discover after surgery and chemotherapy, the Army's response to its medical failure was to discharge him on disability payments without any attempt to discover why its medical system hadn't worked. I don't think I'd be in the shape if they did something for me. I think I'd still be running and walking normal if they did something within the first few weeks of what happened here, because that tumor would never have gotten so big. The Longos have nothing to gain financially from their situation. He is on disability payments as long as he lives. But he did ask the military for an investigation of his case. And there was none. And that drew the attention of Massachusetts Congressman Barney Frank. He was terribly frustrated, not just by the fact that he's uh, been, been, been damaged, but that nobody would look into it. Why would anybody look into it? Well, no one had the responsibility to look into it. OK? Yes, yes, sir. Sir. Okay. The reason no one had the responsibility was because of a little-known legal principle called the Ferris Doctrine. The doctrine was outlined in a 1950 U.S. Supreme Court decision that said neither active duty personnel nor their survivors have the right to sue the military for negligence. Nobody argues with the fundamental reasoning behind that decision. For instance, if soldiers injured in combat or in a field hospital could sue their superior officers, the military obviously couldn't function with any discipline. But the scope of the Ferris Doctrine makes no exceptions for routine situations, such as general medical care. And so that also means the military can't be sued for malpractice and isn't even required to investigate it. And opponents say that aspect of the doctrine is outrageous. If you're a convicted murderer and you are brought to a federal hospital and suffer malpractice, you can sue. If you are a military person, you cannot. It's incongruous. It doesn't make sense. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate mistake that was made in 1950. Robert Guimond is Longo's attorney and a professor of medical physiology who supports a proposal to amend the Ferris Doctrine by allowing some malpractice claims while still protecting the military in combat or field situations. This bill just deals with medical malpractice. But in congressional hearings before Representative Barney Frank, the military and the Justice Department opposed any change whatsoever in its liability for medical care, saying that would have a serious, harmful effect on military order and discipline. I think you make the 
enlisted personnel or the officers, whoever, angrier, and you weaken morale if you say to them, you know, anybody in America could sue the doctor that did that to them, except you, because you made the mistake of volunteering to be a Marine or uh, a sailor, you haven't got the right to sue. And some service people have discovered they don't even have the right to learn why they were disabled during the most routine of procedures, as in the case of Denise Soltis. Soltis had lettered in sports in high school. She joined the Army just after graduation and eventually entered the hospital at Fort McClellan, Alabama for minor gynecological surgery. She came out blind and in a coma. She is still partially paralyzed and her ability to speak was also impaired. I was scared to death. I called my mother the night before and my mom said, don't worry about it. They do it all the time. Um, this kind of surgery, they do it all the time. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Well, I didn't talk to mom until about three months later. I'd sit there and spoon feed her just like when she was just an infant. Because that's the way she had to be fed. They had signed me down with the nurses and doctors. And, and they said, Denise, we have some bad news to tell you. Something went wrong in the surgery. We don't know what. We can't explain what happened. But, but we're sorry. That was all they said to you. That's all they said, yeah. Denise Soltis is now married and receiving disability payments. She has trouble doing basic household chores because of the danger of blackouts from the epilepsy she has suffered since her treatment. Although the Ferris Doctrine prevents her from suing for malpractice, she nevertheless pursued her case through attorney Robert Guimond because the Army would not tell her what happened in the operating room, and she feels she has a right to know. I don't mean to indict military medicine. I have no reason to believe it's any better or worse than the other kind of medicine. But if there is this kind of mistake, there ought to be some recourse, and there isn't right now. Why can't somebody collect for the damages if these doctors are in there just doing it? I think they feel that they've got the government backing them up, and they're getting a regular check from the government, so why do they have to worry about being sued? Because they know they can't be sued. This is the place to screw up. If doctors and civilian lives are having to pay such horrendous malpractice insurance, then by golly, then the, the military should have the same kind of preventatives. They're supposed to have the best doctors in the world. Then if they're not, then it's time to hang them out to dry and find out why. As of 1992, the law remained unchanged, but there were still efforts to amend the Ferris Doctrine. Representative Barney Frank continued his battle to allow members of the armed services to sue for malpractice. His bill passed the House three times, but was blocked in the Senate by powerful opponents on the Judiciary and Armed Services Committees. Testifying before Congress in October 1991, a U.S. military spokesman maintained that amending the Ferris Doctrine will cause serious problems for military morale and discipline, thereby jeopardizing the ability of the Department of Defense to perform its mission. For now, the Ferris Doctrine is still denying our servicemen and women basic rights available to the rest of us and continuing to produce inequitable and bizarre legal results. Like this case, civilian passengers on an airliner struck by a U.S. Air Force plane were allowed to recover damages. Service member passengers were not. Robert Longo, the serviceman whose cancer was misdiagnosed, beat the odds. In 1992, he was still alive and still bitter about his treatment by the defense system. And Denise, 13 years later, was still coping with cerebral palsy and epilepsy, the results of her botched surgery. She doesn't let it slow her down much. An active participant in the Paralympics, she returned to college to get a degree and was planning to be remarried. Still, she says, no one should have to go through what she did. No, nobody knows when they join the military that if for on some unforsaken reason that they happen to be a victim of medical malpractice. Medical malpractice, there is no recourse and there should be. Barney Frank planned to reintroduce his legislation in 1992. In the meantime, Denise Chafee has some advice for young men and women entering the military. First of all, read the fine print. When we come back, we'll look at what can be done to keep track of bad doctors and Harvard Law Professor Arthur Miller on some of the larger issues these cases raise for all of us when The Justice Files continues.
Coming up next, Captain Dangerous Top Guns on Challenge. And now, ideas that give your holidays the personal touch. Try sprinkling sesame seed on buttered Pillsbury Crescent Rolls for a delicate, flaky, extra special dinner roll for the holidays. And for dessert, use your cookie cutters to make decorative holiday cutouts for a pie with Pillsbury Already Pie Crusts. And stay tuned for more creative ideas from Pillsbury. Perfect! <laughs> Norelco shaves incredibly close in exceptional comfort because Norelco's lift and cut system lifts the hair so when it's cut, it can drop below skin level without the blades touching your face. So with every shave, Norelco makes clothes comfortable. Some people buy a prestigious German motor car just to spend and make a big impression at the curb. Not so Volkswagen Passatos. For them, European driving's the thing, and Farfignugan's the word. And as for making an impression, well, nothing impresses a valet more than a man who knows the value of a buck. Buy your kids a conventional keyboard, and here's what they'll learn on their own. For the same money, the Miracle Piano... Actually teach them how to play. I like that it teaches you chords and it's easy. Plus the animation's really good. The Miracle Piano Teaching System. Why buy just a keyboard when you can have a piano that teaches you how to play? Millions of Americans with disabilities are eager and able to contribute to society. That's why Jim Brady is calling on America. Give people with disabilities a chance, and we'll show you what we can do. Tuesday, discover the incredible inventions of yesterday and the amazing technology of tomorrow. First, meet the man behind the fuel-efficient engine of the future and marvel at the world's first fish tie on invention. And then, discover a laser beam with the force of an entire nuclear power plant and dive deep with the latest in underwater photography gear on Next Step. Tuesday, beginning at 9 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Consumer groups are speaking out against bad medicine, urging patients with complaints to come forward to their state medical disciplinary boards. One group has compiled a book, first published in 1990. It's Questionable Doctors, from the Washington-based group Public Citizen and it lists almost 7,000 doctors, dentists, chiropractors, and their offenses, ranging from sexual abuse to failure to pay bills. Public Citizen feels the guide is necessary because states rarely make this information public. The public has much more access to information about the safety of cars than they do about the safety of doctors or prescription drugs. The Federation of State Medical Boards has reservations about abuse of the information. I think the public has the right to know information that's public. At the same time, I don't think a medical board has the duty to go out and notify the public unless the public uh, welfare is at stake. The book's authors say you can't count 100% on state medical boards or books to identify problem doctors and nurses. They urge consumers to get references and ask questions before accepting a medical procedure or medication. The book is just a place to start in protecting yourself and your family. We advise patients, check to see if your doctor is in here, and if he or she is in here, find out why. After seeing these stories, we're left with a fundamental question. How can we get bad doctors and nurses out of the hospital and nursery, yet not damage the competent professionals that make up the bulk of the medical profession? Our legal expert, Professor Arthur Miller of Harvard Law School, has some thoughts on that. One of the sad facts about our modern life is that two distinguished professions, the law and medicine, are at each other's throats. On one hand, we have to get the lawyers to limit their lawsuits to legitimate cases. At the same time, doctors have to do a better job of policing themselves, of giving some real teeth to state medical boards, and getting doctors to weed out the bad apples in their own profession. If someone has been hurt by a doctor, nurse, or hospital, 
he or she certainly has the legal right to sue for compensation. But we have to make sure that every doctor isn't painted with the brush of malpractice. It can be devastating to a career. Moreover, we must recognize that it's the nuisance suits that drive up the cost of health care for every one of us. I'm Forrest Sawyer. Thanks for being with us. Join us again as we look behind the headlines of crime, punishment, and the law on the next edition of The Justice Files. Stay tuned next as fighter pilots, past and present, describe what it takes to be the best. Join host William Shatner for Top Gun, the documentary on Challenge, next. <laughs>